I was saying, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this, this is sort of an interactive fable. Y'all feel free to shout out questions if any of y'all have any questions. The intended audience for this talk is, uh, you know, really just about anybody, but especially career switchers, um, folks who are near in the early stages or in some sort of formative middle stage of their technological career. Uh, this, tar this talk is specifically targeted for y'all, if there's any y'all in the crowd there. Um, and so this fable begins back in the closing days of the George W. Bush administration, late 2008. Um, and uh, with a musician riding down the road, getting a little sick of it all. Um, you know, had been on the road, uh, so that musician is me, just so you know. Uh, but spent my 20s in a, in a band, uh, a hippie band, in case y'all didn't get from the title of this thing, which will be coming up. What did you play? I played the upright bass in an Americana band that was like, you know, I was 24 or so when I joined this band. Uh, I just joined it for a year or so to, you know, my, my commitment was, I'll, I'll just, I'm from Atlanta, I'll move up to Jersey, join this, you know, Americana band, they've got some gigs lined up, sounded pretty cool. I'll check it out for like 12, 18 months and see what happens, you know. And here I am, 18 years later, still living in New Jersey. Um, so, uh, you know, it was fun for my 20s. And then as, you know, the 20s came to a close and I started, I got married, started having children, uh, the fun level was, you know, rather impacted by the stresses of life, you know. And so, um, you know, riding down I-81 towards a festival in Southern Virginia, I think shortly after the iPhone uh, version 2 was released where they allowed you to write actual third-party apps for this thing. I was cruising down the road playing on this thing and had this sort of light bulb moment um, that, you know, software seems like it's going to be a big deal. <laughs> and it seems like the kind of big deal where I as a, you know, historically somebody who doesn't like working for people um, and who fancies myself uh, this teeny bit of a, like a creative sort of craftsman, not necessarily an artist, but more like a craftsman is kind of how I always, always approached my music career anyway. And it seemed like it could map pretty well because I was always into computers. Um, I was sort of like the recording archivist for this band. And so it was like, you know, it, it seemed like a logical step to me at that, t at that point in time. Um, and as we mentioned, I was, you know, late into, uh, you know, in, in my late 20s, early 30s at this point in time. And I was just kind of getting worn out of the scene that uh, I was in, I guess, you know, I just didn't see like where, where the music was, where, where the music career was going to go, that it was going to take me, um, that it was going to provide for a comfortable life for my family, uh, where I was even going to be around to raise that family, you know, and so I was just kind of getting sick of it all and looking for what, what the next thing was going to be, and it was, uh, you know, I just kind of had this light bulb moment uh, in the car. And so, uh, you know, I... I was more or less instantly obsessed with the idea of becoming a software developer at that point. Unfortunately, I didn't have anybody, um, you know, I didn't have any mentors in the field. All I knew were other hippie musicians such as myself, uh, such as myself. And so um, I just started reading, you know, basically everything that I could get my hands on. It started with like uh, Daring Fireball was the, you know, the big Apple blog at the time. And, you know, that was when RSS was like the method by which we shared our content with each other it was just glorious. That was back in the days of the fun internet, you know. Um, and one of the pieces of advice that I came across at that point in time, and this is my first sort of uh, bit for, uh, for this talk, is, is to write more. Um, I read this, this bit uh, in somebody's blog, it was very meta at the time, um, that people like to know their toy maker, you know. Uh, if you're looking to build a, a career in technology, not only does it help to um, sort of formulate your thoughts and crystallize your thoughts into a written, you know, a written thing that can, A, prove that you know how to write to, uh, to anybody who might be following up on, you know, like a uh, potential hiring manager later. But it also just helps to leave like a breadcrumb trail for you um, later on. It's sort of like, um, oh, excuse me, wrong way, wrong way. Here we go. Um, writing, I was kind of thinking about this this morning. It's like, writing in general, and I personally need to take my own advice here, but it's almost like taking a picture of the inside of your brain, whereas Instagram is like this feed or your photo collection on your computer is sort of like this, this you know, it's like a, it's your a documentary of your life, you know, um, in pictures. 
Whereas writing is like a, it's almost like taking pictures of the inside of your head of what you're thinking at the time. And so it's really, it's been, it's been a useful tool to me to look back, um, you know, late 2008, 2009, actually my, my blog, I think turns 11 in a couple of days, I think is when I wrote the first post. I was still on the road in a tour bus at this point, no longer in the van, so, you know, the trappings of success. We had Wi-Fi on the bus. It was pretty awesome. And that's when I just started sitting down trying to get some of the thoughts out of my head um, for how I wanted to make this step from musician to, uh, to technologist of some sort. And it really helped me a lot. I was, uh, you know, I was, I look back on those writings now and I'm like, I, I had no idea what I was talking about whatsoever, but I was so productive because I had no idea what I was talking about. I had no reservations whatsoever. It was like every, every idea that I had was, you know, uh, the first time that I had had it. And I just had like, I guess the chutzpah or the ego of, of a late twenties musician to think that, you know, it was worth writing down. And so, um, it's really helpful to go back and read that stuff now. And also, um, you know, as an added bonus, we live in an age now in 2020 where basically all of us, even if we go to an office every day and sit next to our coworkers, the vast majority of our jobs are taking place via written words of some sort or another, whether it's email or Slack. Um, I'm working for a remote company now. Our entire business runs through Slack. And so being able to formulate thoughts into a written word that other people can understand across time zones and cultures and languages is an incredibly valuable skill for anybody's career. And it only gets better with practice. Uh, we all have plenty of well-formed thoughts in our head, but trying to transmit them into other people's heads takes practice. And so the best, you know, the, the blog or anywhere you want to do it, uh, but the blog especially because it kind of holds you a little bit accountable um, to publish something out where other people can read it. And like I said earlier, it has the added bonus of being a sort of a trail that other people can see that you actually are able to form coherent thoughts in writing, which now as a hiring manager, I can tell you is a pretty rare skill. Um, you know, I always, when people submit resumes, I actually follow the links that are on there and follow the links from there, you know, just to just get an idea of the candidate. Um, and so it's, it's pretty rare that people have uh, you know, an, a, a blog at all, but certainly not an updated one that you can kind of get a sense for, you know, what, what they're interested in and how well they write. Um, and so this is from hippie musician to hiring manager, a career development fable. Um, I'm going to try not to excessively talk about myself and actually just, you know, get to the meat of it here in a minute. Uh, but thanks for coming. If you missed this up front, this is not the Maslow's hierarchy thing. This is about career development. And so uh, I am John Grubb. I work at Platform.sh. I am the director of customer care. So part of uh, this fable will be how I went from uh, musician to wannabe technologist to programmer to director of customer care and hopefully what that means. Um, and uh, so... To resume the, ta the, the, the tale, um, I think two th late 2009 was when it finally just kind of came to a head for me and I was pretty much just done with that career path <laughs> and I uh, still was yet young enough to, to believe that I could just jump to an entirely new career and make something out of it. Um, but 2010 was the year where, you know, basically pre almost precisely 10 years ago was when I made this hard sort of hard stop on the previous career and start and had to cobble together this new one. Um, and so this leads me to my next little just thought. Um, this was an incredibly, probably in hindsight, probably an incredibly bad idea for me to make such, an, such a sudden jump from one career to another, but, um, you know, putting yourself in uncomfortable situations is a really fertile place for um, finding out new things about yourself and for pushing yourselves in directions that you didn't really think you were uh, capable of, as well as exposing yourself to new situations that you know you don't know how to handle handle um, already. And so, uh, AKA burn the boats. Um, so I spent this, you know, I spent 2010 and 2011 mostly just trying to uh, learn anything that I could from the web at this point um, about. You know, I think the very first code I wrote, quote unquote, 
uh, in any sort of an editor was probably exactly 10 years ago, honestly. I took this flat HTML page and turned it into a WordPress theme with the help of some video I found on YouTube. Um, and it was a revelatory to actually have gotten something done. And I, I spent, as you know, as, as this, started, this story started in mid-2008, so I spent 18 months or so just sort of like staring at the computer and reading about development and not really understanding, not really putting it together, not actually you know, pushing myself into the zone where I had to start producing something until I finally just burnt the boat basically with my music career and jumped into technology. And this, that very first month, January 2010, was uh, you know, a terrifying month for many personal reasons, but you know, on the career level it was like, okay, it's time to, time to go. And so I, you know, whether it's a job you've been at for 10 years or just a position you've been at within that company, you know, it's good to push yourself into uncomfortable positions because the world is, as we know, I mean, this is not, you know, this is not revelatory advice, but the world is continually changing. The technology market is continually changing. And so if you're sitting sort of in the same seat, the same team, same company for too long, you know, you're going to get stale as far as your skill sets and those roles you're going to be probably in maintenance mode, um, not just on the software that you're working on, but also in the career skills that you're developing. And so it's, it's good to look for these opportunities and push yourself into some uncomfortable situations. Um, I've kind of done that a, a number of times since, um, since jumping and, you know, doing the big one here, um, 10 years ago. Uh, and it's, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's, 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 I, I can recommend it. The uncomfortable feeling gets more comfortable with time. It's kind of like to the point now where I'm a little bit, did, did my mic just go? Yeah. Uh, where, well, I mean, I can keep talking, but the recording's not gonna work, or is it? I can just talk. Y'all can hear me. It will work, but just not too much of a throng in here. So I'll just use my theater voice. Um, so let's see. So yeah, I spent uh, basically, <laughs> um, all of 2010 and 2011 just trying to like make ends meet essentially and that was uh, that was actually how I found Drupal. Um, I was kind of kicking, you know, as I said earlier, kicking WordPress around as maybe a vehicle for uh, getting some contracts and getting some work done and eventually I don't know exactly what led me to notice that I had airline miles that could get me out to San Francisco for DrupalCon in 2010. Uh, but I went to DrupalCon in 2010 and that was my very first Drupal event. I had poked at it and like installed it on, you know, XAMP or whatever it was that I was running locally at the time, um, but never really like got anywhere with it. You know that first Drupal experience where you're like you fire it up and it's like okay now what do I do? Like what is a block? You remember those days? Um, weren't those great days? Um, and so anyway, I went out to I, I don't know for whatever reason I had a buddy that could let me crash on his play in it you know on his on his couch out in San Francisco and so I flew out to San Francisco and went to uh, went to DrupalCon out there in 2010 and it was just like. I just drank all the Drupal Kool-Aid from the fire hose that was DrupalCon uh, 10 years ago, you know, and it was just, it was, it was like, it was so familiar feeling, yet at the same time bizarre, you know, um, so uh, just because of the community vibe, I don't know, it reminded me of like, it remind, honestly, the, the vibe that I had was a, like a bluegrass festival or something like that, where all these friends get together and like, yeah, I don't know. It's just like it was the community vibe that I that I knew from this past life, but I was always looking for, you know. Um, especially after I sort of hard cut that old life, um, and so I spent you know 2010, 2011 picking up Drupal work and you know doing doing work for uh, you know nonprofits mostly. I did a little bit of stuff here and there for uh, you know basically who whoever whoever needed work and whoever would pay me at the time, um, and that was actually a really good experience because I. Through Drupal, you know, Drupal is the thing where you don't have to know how to build the web. Uh, you don't have to know how to write code in order to build things for the web. And so that was like perfect for me. I was able to learn about web development by using Drupal. <coughs> Excuse me. And put the pieces together sort of after the fact, after I figured out like, oh, what databases are and how they work and like how HTTP works. Drupal taught me all that stuff in these, in this, during this time period. Um, and so, my next one is, is be, op be open and to, to new and different opportunities, and that kind of goes together with the last one as far as putting yourself in uncomfort uncomfortable situations, because those uncomfortable situations will lead to new opportunities. That's kind of like, that's, you know, um, 
the creative destruction that is uncomfortable situations. And so anyway, I did that for a couple years. Uh, it was actually <coughs> on paper and in my head for those couple of years, it was kind of like the perfect job in that I didn't, I still didn't have a boss. I got to make my own hours. Um, I was learning on the job, which is something I always, you know, I, we probably a lot of us really enjoy. Um, and it was actually perfect until it wasn't. And when specifically it wasn't was when child number three was born in uh, 2012. And that's when it just kind of got a little bit overwhelming. And so that was <coughs> almost to the day. Excuse me, one of those children. This, this is uh, not coronavirus, don't worry. It's, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a very much a pre-existing condition from one of those kids. And so, um, it, uh, uh, and so like al almost to the day that I realized I cannot do this anymore is when I got the call from the tech recruiter who was looking to hire me uh, or hire someone into what would later become my first office job. And so, um, first of all, I just want to take a moment to call your attention to a, a fact that we can probably take for granted, some of us anyway, that we are blessed to live in New Jersey because there is more opportunity here. There are more jobs. The economy is strong. You know, I know the taxes are outrageous, but as somebody who comes from the South where the taxes are not outrageous, let me tell you, you get what you pay for, okay? New Jersey is a wonderful place to live. And we've talked about leaving, but we have never pulled the trigger. We don't have any family here. I have a remote job now that we could take anywhere. Uh, but we still just kind of stay here because it's, it's just a great place to live. There's, I, there's almost endless opportunity, and it pays really well, and the standard of living is good. And, and it's easy to take those things for granted if you have lived here for long enough. And so um, one of these opportunities that presented itself was this small publishing company in Morris County that I worked at for like four years or so. And uh, so I started there as a basically a front end dev. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I knew this was going to happen right about now. And so um, I started there as a front end dev because front end dev is enough of writing code, but at the time, and I knew this in my head, and I don't mean to um, minimize the front end devs in the house, but I was able to call myself a front end dev without really needing to know how the back end worked. You know what I mean? And so I was able to polish the career, um, build the career, build the resume, build the skill set by starting with basically like JavaScript and CSS, you know? Um, and so uh, one of our, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be in this, it was a small company. Um, small publishing companies are kind of like, a, one way to say it, if you were a recruiter, would be that it's, it's a very dynamic industry, you know? It's changing a lot. Now that I'm not in it, it's because it's like perennially circling the dream, you know what I mean? And so it's like, there's this real anything goes approach to, uh, you know, to, to basically any idea that anybody has, even in the smallest of publishing companies. And that was the environment that I found myself in. And so um, it was really fun. I got to learn a lot on the job. And so, you know, after our senior developer was poached, off by Johnson & Johnson after I'd been there for about a year or so. I was basically the senior person on staff. And so, yeah, sorry, that's uncomfortable for anybody. Um, if anybody's had anybody poached by Johnson & Johnson, I don't know, you know, whatever. Um, so I moved into basically full stack. I, I, I moved into infrastructure after, uh, you know, like our, our big name Drupal hosting vendor was just not really like meeting our needs, our more agile needs, you know. Uh, I started teaching myself about AWS. I had full leash to kind of do that. Um, I moved into, like, you know, finally we had everything built. We had we migrated from Ektron onto Drupal. You know, that took a couple of years to actually get that all buttoned up. We had a lot of different sort of products that were, evol you know, revolving around Drupal and this Drupal migration um, that, you know, I got to cut my teeth on and, and build up the skill set. Uh, eventually, that was sort of like done for now and we had new product lines that you know of course it's publishing which means it's advertising which means there's lots of like sort of basically sketchy big brother stuff that I'm happy not to be involved with anymore uh, but advertising and data basically knowing what the what, you know like what what the user is doing on your website that's that's how they pay their bills um, and so eventually uh, by the end of that I had moved into what was titled a management position but it wasn't really like I wasn't actually managing because this was a tiny little team it was just more like lead dev or so. And so, um, I love this picture because what the hell is that? Um, I just typed in ceiling into this 
particular like image search thing, but yeah, it's like a it's like a dome with the sun coming in, and so um, that gig was great until it wasn't, you know. And when it when it wasn't was uh, you know after about four years or so, I had uh, I don't know it was a publishing company. My idea back when I was a hippie musician was to get into technology because I wanted to work with technology, not necessarily like advertising and publishing, you know what I mean? Which I learned a lot through that, um, but it, you know, it wasn't why I got into it. And also there's a certain like, within media companies, there's only so high you can go as a technologist no matter how good you are because it's a media company, it's not a technology company, you know? And that's just kind of the way of the world. And so, Q phase three. Um, let me take some water real quick. Because I could feel that. <sighs> we went down to Florida a couple weeks ago. That's where they got together with their cousins. And I'm blaming the cousins for this. Um, so excuse me. Q phase three. Um, and some more advice, I promise. Uh, not that y'all need it, but... Um, so phase three was was actually quitting or you know announcing my uh, my moving on to my current gig at Platform SH. Um, Platform SH is I'm I'm not going to give you a sales pitch, but just so you know who we are, it's a basically you can think of it as a hosting company if you want to, uh, but mainly you know we're a remote a fully remote software company. Um, we have an office in Paris where the headquarters uh, are. There's about maybe 10 people in the Paris office and the other 150-ish of us are distributed all over the globe. And so this was my first experience with remote working whatsoever. Um, leading back to the original advice about learning to write well, this is where it really came uh, into focus was when I took this job. And so, uh, you know, I think I was, I was, number, I was employee number 32 or so um, at the time, we had just split from Commerce Guys, so if y'all been around the Drupal community for long enough, you're probably like aware of like uh, how or when that went down, but that's, that's how long I've been there. It's coming up on four years this year. And so um, I specifically took this job because I was looking to get out of my comfort zone. Um, I pretty much knew what was going on inside the publishing business, and especially at this particular publishing business. I wasn't interested in pursuing publishing at a larger company. I wasn't interested in really in pursuing Drupal development anymore, to be honest. This was about the time that Drupal 8 came out, and my thought process at the time was that if I'm going to have to learn something entirely new, and, you know, regardless of, of whether it is or not, if I, this was my thought process at the time, if I'm going to have to learn something entirely new, well, it's either going to be like some completely different piece of software just because... Um, I think I held a little bit of a grudge, honestly, against Drupal 8. But, or I'm going to move in a completely different direction, which is what I, I ended up doing um, with this move here. And so, uh, sorry, if, uh, this is the first time I've given this talk, so I warned y'all up front, okay? Um, but one of, the things, one of the things that really appealed to me about this gig was that it was a small company. It was either going to grow and do well or it was going to uh, not do well. And it was going to be, again, over in like 18 months. This is what I always think. You know, this is going to be a 12 to 18 month commitment. And here I am four years later still working here. Um, so, you know, it's worked out. That's, that's good. Um, and one of the things that really appealed to me about this was that it was a growing situation. And once I figure out kind of what's going on inside here, I'm probably going to be able to apply like some different perspective as, you know, like, uh, they did, I didn't think they had any other hippie musicians inside this company. Turns out I was wrong. Um, and actually, we probably all do. Uh, but I thought, you know, this, this would be a cool place to, like, this is going to be a growing company. There's going to be opportunity. There's going to be ever-expanding green fields if this thing goes, uh, goes the right path. And so, you know, I hopped on board. And that is uh, my fourth piece of sort of, like, little tidbit here is that, we probably all work with really smart people, people that are smarter than, well, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I work with a lot of people that are way smarter than me. That was part of why I took this gig. Um, and a lot of those people are way better at getting down into the weeds and figuring out the details than I am. Um, but there are not a ton of people in this world, and I can say this with a reasonable degree of confidence, there are not a ton of people in the world who are capable of sort of zooming out 
and taking a look at the big picture and figuring out how this detail over here relates to this detail over here and connecting the dots in a way that is meaningful for like the business overall rather than this one little initiative. And so if any of y'all are predisposed or inclined in this direction, you know, there is a big shortage of people who like to look outside their box and think outside their box. And it can be kind of troublesome if you don't have the role to look outside the box and make suggestions for things that are in somebody else's box. But just be patient. Analyze the situation. Um, because the world is changing, as, you know, as we all know. And there are always opportunities to move up, which is eventually what happened here, right? So, um, and, and a sort of caveat to this is like, you don't, have to, you don't have to look at the bigger picture all the time. You, you shouldn't look at the bigger picture all the time, probably, because you'll never ship like the exact priorities that you have that are on your plate right then. Um, <coughs> but step back and basically, re, you know, just an, an, analyze the landscape around you every X number of months or X number of years, you know. Um, career development should be an agile process, as agile is, you know, is meant to be, where, you know, you, you build a thing, you, sh you, you build something small, you don't plan the entire journey from like start to finish. You don't plan your next four years of you know development cycle and shipping a product um, out to the market. Not anymore because stuff is shipped on the internet, you know, daily. And so what you do, what you're supposed to do, I'm sure we none of us actually do this, but the the, the ideal is you know you ship a thing out, ship ship something small, reassess. Uh, Ship something small that the market needs then. Reassess. You know, that is sort of the essence of Agile, and that's exactly how I think careers should be sort of looked at. Um, you know, because I might have an idea of where I think I'd like to be in 10 years or so, which is raising goats and relative peace in upstate New York, probably. But yeah, I have no idea if that's going to happen um, or how the hell I would get there. You know, and so it's just sort of like a, a just a, a, an agile process. That's the that's the the main takeaway. Um, you know, work, 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 reassess. Work, 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 reassess. Basically, um, let's see. And this is actually sort of like the main point of the whole talk. Uh, stay curious. Like it's hard to do. Because we are all inundated on a day-to-day -day basis with so many responsibilities to ship, so much horrible news in the world, um, and just so much ever-expanding and reinventing technology that it is really difficult to keep up and to stay curious about things that are outside of your, your scope. But if you, you've got to make yourself do it. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself not just not curious, but probably bored and stuck in some, you know, like a, a team that someday is going to disappear. Um, regardless of what business you are in, regardless of who you work for, how big your team is, there are opportunities all around you. In the publishing company, which actually filed, I didn't, I didn't know what Chapter 7 was. Chapter 7 bankruptcy is the one where you're all fired. Get the fuck out. That's what Chapter Seven is, and that's what that's what actually happened uh, to the publishing company uh, that I worked for. Fortunately, after I left, uh, this this happened like uh, oh gosh, I don't know, less than a year ago now. But they were still building tons of sh stuff. Like even as they were on the verge of um, you know oblivion, basically, they were still like they had just built you know sort of the data platform. That was, you know, my boss at the time who runs Twin Elephant Brewing. Is anybody from Chatham or the Chatham area? There's a brewery called Twin Elephant Brewing that makes some of probably the best hoppy beer in New Jersey. If you like hoppy beers and you're near Chatham, you're going to Newark Airport or something like that, it's right off 24. It's called Twin Elephant Brewing. Unfortunately, they're not really canning and distributing yet. They're still pretty small. Uh, but that's my old boss. He opened that. He opened that brewery um, three, four years ago, and they make they have they have the best hoppy beers uh, in New Jersey. So so saith me. Um, but they were still shipping like amazing stuff, you know. And so it's really just kind of a matter of looking around and, like I said, connecting the dots and seeing where the opportunities are. Um, 
and trying not to get overwhelmed and trying to prioritize them. Um, so uh, most people are not really able to stay curious in the long run and it ebbs and it flows certainly for myself um and just like with like absolute closing advice you know um when my brain has the capacity for new stuff podcasts obviously are a fantastic resource even if it's just listening to news it's like i taught myself programming whatever the heck that means by basically pounding books into my head for a number of years and that's sort of given way to like podcasts because it's like, um, it's like career development books. It's like career development consulting basically in sort of like a, a relatively easily consumable format. I'm just kind of obsessed with podcasts lately, not just for career development purposes, but just generally like uh, stepping away from the office, stepping away from my desk, I should say, and getting out into the woods. Three? What's that? What's your top three? Um, so... That's a great question. I, um, the A16, like the, the shit that I'm obsessed with lately is like how SaaS businesses work because Platform SH is a SaaS business. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the first thing about SaaS business in general or like venture capital. Like we're, you know, we took a, a funding round like a couple of years ago and like, what the hell does that even mean? You know, and this is like the stuff that I'm curious about right now. So the A16Z podcast, uh, is probably my favorite one right now. If you're into just like it, it's, uh, there are Silicon Valley podcasts that are just unlistenable because they're so full of like jargon and annoying Silicon Valley people. But this is like, pro this is not one of those. Uh, A16Z is a VC firm, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, Mark Andreessen, uh, you know, started Mozilla uh, invented the uh, was the invented the Netscape browser. So like he is literally the dude who you know uh, played a part in inventing the browser and in inventing the internet as we know it. Um, and Ben Horowitz is his partner at this this uh, VC firm. And so they have a fantastic. They of course they fund every company you've ever heard of that is is successful right now in the valley. And and sure like. Ten times more that you've never heard of, you know, because that's just the way the game gets played. But that is a tremendous resource, not just for um, how SaaS businesses work, but just generally thinking about technology in the future. That is probably that is definitely one of my favorites. Um, Pod Save the World, like that's a pod, that's a politics podcast, but it's it's global politics, so it's not too depressing. I mean, it is depressing, but it's not locally depressing. You know what I mean? Um, it's, uh, if, if you never, well, anyway, look it up, Pod Save the World. Um, they have a, 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 sort of like the, the progenitor podcast was Pod Save America. That one is truly depressing. I still listen to it because I like to, I don't know, like emotionally cut myself or something like that. Um, but it's the same crew of people. Um, and then, I, I don't know. I don't know if I've got a third. Like, I cycle through probably 20 different ones. Honestly, um, I listen to, I guess, too much politics because the next one that's jumping in my head is, uh, why is this happening? Uh, Chris Hayes is a anchor on MSNBC, which I don't watch M MSNBC because reasons, but like, I don't, he's got this, he's got this long form podcast. That's actually a lot more like history than it is news. Um, and I, I don't know. I just, I like, I like their perspectives and he gets really intelligent people on that show. And so, you know, between, the, I, I guess those are the three that are jumping to mind for podcasts. But then I've got like this army of different, uh, different ones that are basically kind of all revolving around uh, SaaS. And so actually, as long as we're, as long as I'm making this up, um, my gig right now is director of customer care. And so I basically quit writing code, at least as a, you know, like I'm going to ship things that I've built like that was no longer my job when I started here at Platform SH. Uh, I'm going to hit that pre-sales buff at four o'clock because um, that's what I was doing when I started here at Platform SH was solutions architect. So basically, I went from writing code to sort of a, a, a business position where um, you're in charge of diagnosing other people's code and their businesses and figuring out how their code and their business is going to run successfully on Platform SH. And they hired somebody with no experience in doing that. 
Um, so there was a lot of like on the job learning and mistakes made in my early days. Uh, but I just, I'm like, I'm su super fascinated with how SaaS businesses uh, run. And so it, I don't know, it just, it ended up working out. So my current gig, after I did a little stint as solutions architect, now I'm director of customer care, which basically means probably exactly what it sounds like. Um, so it started off as the complaint department, basically. Um, we would have, you know, we've got a support team of like 40 or 50 people, you know, spread all over the globe. And so, um, you know, we have a, a very robust su support team, which was not the case when I started there. Um, we were 10 minutes. Yeah, no problem. Um, which support teams are designed around like a request response model, basically, just like HTTP. You know what I mean? And so anything that doesn't fit into a request and response model, like thing broken, thing fixed, um, you know, like support teams not really designed to handle that. Um, at least our support team was not designed to handle that. We didn't have any specialists. And that's when like shit would leak out to the, the salesperson who originally like, you know, signed this contract with this person, or I would jump on the thing just because I like talking to people. Uh, this was a thing that I learned about myself from being a musician, I guess, you know, it's like, I like people, I like, like networking, you know? Um, and so I just, I found myself basically in charge of the complaint department, which was three of us at the time that I took it over. And so my last podcast, if I, you know, that's, that's the question I'm answering. Uh, my fourth favorite podcast is about customer success in general. Customer success is like the, the process of account management now in an era where you don't sign contracts for a year or three years or five years with a vendor and then you get, you know, like a yearly checkup call. But SaaS businesses have like this monthly recurring revenue. So there's like this, you know, every month there's a check-in and every week they might open a ticket or have a bad experience once a quarter or something like that. It's just, just really incredible like manic data environment with all these different things that are going on and, and basically customer success is what it sounds like. We have misnamed it customer care at my team, at, at my company, but we'll straighten that out someday. Um, so basically I listen to, I listen to pretty much anything I get my head on, hands on about customer success because I come from a developer background. Well, hippie musician to developer. Um, I don't know, squat about like KPIs or, you know, any of these like, business things that you know, care about in Silicon Valley. Investors and boards and people like that care about. So I've just been sort of like pounding yet again um, new stuff into my head via podcast because they don't write books about customer success. I mean, they do. There's a couple of them out there, uh, but they're like, they're, you know, they're, they're thin. They're like brochures, you know, uh, because it's, this stuff is evolving very quickly and there's, um, you know, a lot of opportunity but it's also pretty challenging. And so that's the gig that I'm doing now and trying to, you know, just continually trying to get my head around it, essentially. Um, and so a couple of good ones, if anybody's interested, there's a, the granddaddy of sort of like the software space in customer success is called Gainsight. I don't know if anybody cares about customer success at all, but um, they are the ones who are able to get uh, sort of like the, the thought leaders about how, you know, if, if you're, if anybody here is in charge of like, touching customers, you know, not just shipping code, but touching customers and trying to help them with whatever their problem is. I mean, whether it's like a, an actual problem or just like a, the, the reason they came to you in the first place, you know, um, to your company or your uh, Drupal shop or whatever in the first place, um, they're trying to solve a problem, you know. And so customer success is basically the, the, the all the machinery around trying to proactively interactively, collaboratively um, help customers solve their problems in an ongoing basis, you know? So it's like, it is as broad as it sounds. Um, you know, I'm still writing, I'm, I'm still debugging uh, customers' hellishly, horribly performing applications because they all suck. So it's not just like uh, one particular customer, like all applications are a nightmare as a person who works for a hosting company now. Um, I still really enjoy getting down in the weeds and debugging things and figuring out where the performance problems are and helping people out. And so it's just, it's sort of like a synth, it's, it's like a synthesis, I guess, or a, it's all of the things that I've ever cared about. Um, you know, working with people, helping people, 
debugging things, like having some quick, easy wins sort of wrapped up into one gig. So, oh, uh, that, is, that is the last slide. I am done, but we are actually hiring, of course, because um, I guess everybody's hiring all the time. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fun gig, um, and, you know, like you can talk to me directly if anybody's looking for like a career switch into something around customer success. That was not the point of this talk. I just, I would be remiss if I did not mention that. Um, so, wow, I can talk for like 40 minutes straight. Um, that's horrifying, actually. So, does, uh, I don't know. I mean, I was going to try and leave more time for like Q&A kind of thing, but... I don't know if I put y'all to sleep or what. So, you know, does anybody have any questions or many, anybody got anything they want to talk about with five minutes or so we got left? Let her rip. So now that you're not doing like the day-to-day -day development, how do you, um, how do you kind of prevent like skills rot from like creeping in? You can't. <laughs> the question was, now that I'm not doing development day-to-day, um, how do I prevent skill rot? Um, you know, like my, how do I prevent rust? And I am not trying to prevent rust, essentially. That's not my gig anymore, and it makes me sad in a way to not be able to jump into a Drupal code base, especially a Drupal 8 code base, and know my way around. Um, it's like heaven to jump into Drupal 7 because I know exactly where everything is. And it's hell on earth and really depressing to jump into a Drupal 8 code base uh, because I don't know where anything is, you know? And so that's not my gig anymore, you know? And I am not actually, I'm not actually sad about it at all because what my gig is now is instead of analyzing or working with or improving a software system, it's analyzing and improving a business system. And so it's like, the exact, it, it, it's actually vastly more interesting to me where I am now. So I'm not sad about those skills going to rust. Um, and enough of like the debugging and performance stuff, it just seems to still be there and the need for it still comes up, up enough on like a regular basis to, to like, uh, for instance, be able to hop into a, a, a ill-performing server setup, uh, customer mad, customer want know why things suck and be able to hop into a you know just a miles long list of charts and be like oh there's the problem right there have we looked at this you know and then I've got a team of like 16 people now have we looked at this oh no I was blah, 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 I missed it. you know um, it's like a, a, the debugging and the sort of like seeing the big picture part of it um, from the various tooling and blah 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 still comes up like all the time and it's the most satisfying freaking feeling because that, that skill still gets exercised a lot. There's still a ton of need for it. And so, like, that one hasn't rusted at all. But, like, my Drupal-specific knowledge, like, PHP especially, uh, I used to be really sharp with SQL, and I just can't, like, I, I can't remember beyond the basics anymore. And that's sad because that's, that's stuff that'll, you know, keep you relevant for the rest of our natural lives. Um, but I don't know. It's just, like, it's like... It's like um, software development is a lot like playing music because it's all just sort of like that creative math brain, whereas doing customer success and analyzing a business system is just like software development because it's really just looking at a system and how the pieces interact with each other and figuring out where the thing is effed up, you know, and then fixing the plumbing between the two, you know. So it's like it, it, it feels very similar, the whole thing from, you know, from when I was 20 to now, basically. You can't prevent skills rot. <laughs> it's going to happen, you know? It, except for a couple of my coworkers who apparently are young and evergreen and retain everything, but I am not one of those people. I don't know most of y'all, but y'all are like my friends now. Thank you for letting me, you know, like, uh, make this thing up, like, uh, very much last minute. I appreciate y'all sort of like listening. Anybody's looking for a gig, holla.